um, we're still working with our hands technology. Um, but it's it's pretty, I think we picked a pretty catchy title. There's a lot of people in here. Um, we're going to present a common by the to bring DevOps into an organization. So the slides are not going to be listing the 100 ideas slide by slide for 60 minutes. 100 ideas is going to be 30 seconds. Um, we are not that bad yet. It's, it's more about lessons learned, catchy phrases, ideas that we wrote down. Uh, we managed to get roughly 90, I believe. So if you have your own favorite saying about DevOps and how to get DevOps ready in an organization, feel free to open up the Q&A sheet that we use from, from the Google presentation. Um, we have some minutes in the end that you can read through them and maybe if there is one, we just add them to our list. We were thinking of actually putting our working sheets, the 100 things, um, into public afterwards. Not sure yet what we want to do with them, but um, that, that's the idea. So who, who are we? What are we working on? Um, I, I joined Allianz about three years ago um, in, in a very small team, two to three people, um, and we had the idea to build a new DevOps platform. So a platform that has all the fancy thing in there. Container runtime, CI, CD pipelines, infrastructure as code approach, monitoring as a first primitive, um, and of course some, something about security. So since then we have grown a team of about 18 people now. Um, we turned our product into a real service that can be ordered. And we are also trying to change the organization to spread the way we are working throughout the organization. And what is the organization and how do we change this? This is basically the idea of, of this talk. So this is what you usually see. I'm not going to do the good morning hands up thing, um, but I think this is you know, how traditionally you manage projects if you f um, follow the, the triangle of project management. So you control resources, time and scope and try to maintain the quality, right? So basically our assumption is this is not working in, in software projects. Rather, and here we have our first idea already and we're going to note them with the numbers. It's not maybe so fine on the, on the visuals, but just to give you a reference that we actually added 100 or 90 of them. How about the speed that we are looking for? We measure by a new developer who joins your team is able to push code into production on the very first day. I think then we are quick. Then we have developer velocity. And basically all of the other slides that we have will give you some insights on the dimensions of what it needs to make this a reality. And I'm not selling that we are super perfect at this. We are you know, far from it. But at least we have an idea and a vision over here. Because what is it that hinders developer velocity and speeding up software delivery? We basically believe in order to get high developer velocity, you need to reduce the friction. So friction is what drags you down. It's like the tractor, you know, trying to run in the mud. It's the developer that is uh, stopped down by processes, approval processes, no access to systems, whatever you have especially in this big kind of organizations like Allianz, there is a, a long legacy of IT operations um, and processes around. It is to reduce the inventory. That basically means code that's not in production doesn't provide any value. Don't build for the inventory, build for the customer. And in the end, it's to avoid unneeded work. I mean, this, this car that we have over there, I guess there is a demand from someone but maybe not for the big market. And software engineering shouldn't be to do these handcrafted, custom-made cars in the end. So for our 100 ideas, we are, oh yeah, we are basically saying DevOps, and that's what we're gonna talk today about, is about reducing the friction. We have ideas like the Lean Startup methodology to reduce the inventory, to go via MVPs and, and you know, spin that cycle of creating MVPs and then learning from the MV MVPs as quickly as possible, basically ship into production daily, and then avoid the unneeded work is basically agile, we are saying. And we're not gonna cover all three of them, so we talk about how to reduce friction in an organization today. Still, in our ideas, 
These are the catchphrases, right? You can't steer if you're not moving. If you want to change direction and you're not moving, how is that supposed to work? The better you can steer, the better you have the feedback, the better you can control your direction, and that will also be part of a later slide that we're going to discuss. I said already, non-production code is a liability. Basically, it's money you spend that doesn't provide any value yet. It's like stuff on stock, reduces your cash flow. So get that stuff out into production. And then 49, we're saying, well, if you run unicorn sprints frequently, rethink your DevOps approach. So we believe unicorn sprints are, are a good idea and Dario is going to explain later on what they are because they allow you to basically fix stuff that's not working. But if you need to do that over and over again, maybe you've got to rethink your DevOps approach. So I guess idea after, after idea, you, you get your idea of what is the, you know, the purpose of the different catchphrases that we put into here. So now we are basically going to talk about a, a lot about the discipline because it's a very, very important concept. So imagine that you want to be the fastest person in the planet. So in the beginning, you of course need to know the technique. And the technique is something that you have to take care a lot about in the beginning. So you have to know how is your next step going to be and you pay a lot of attention to it. But that's only at the beginning. You have a teacher, He's basically giving some lessons, then you have some practice, and then you are mastering that technique. And when you, when you become a master, is when you actually don't realize all these steps that do, you are basically doing. So you don't know anymore how you did it before. You don't pay attention to it, basically. And that's when you are become the elite. You are becoming the elite. So with Usain Bolt, that's what happens. He is the fastest person in the earth. And he will be a terrible teacher as well, because he doesn't know anymore how he began with it. So this is what we call the confidence, uh, and the discipline is basically building this trust, which is very important because once you have the trust, you have the confidence, and then you are basically reaching this level of maturity we are talking about. So how is this going to be translated into software? We just have something called open source, and we can use it as example. I mean, in the last 20, 30 years, there is a very, very well-defined set of techniques that are proven that they work, and we can use them. This is what we call the discipline. So this is what we have to learn. And taking the example from before about the developer who joins a company, we have a very, very interesting metric that is every new developer should be able to contribute code to production on his or her first day. So here's an example. We have Jane Doe, and she's a new developer. She basically has a very, very small feature to develop. I mean, can't be, it shouldn't be a, something difficult. Of course, you don't have the context. You don't know the systems of the company. And well, she's pushing some code, of course. And then there is another idea that we think is very, very interesting regarding the robots. So we want to avoid the conflict when, when possible. And imagine that at the company we have some code standards. So we really want to follow those code standards. But maybe Jane doesn't know about that. So if I'm annoying Jane, hey, look, this line is too long. Or look, in my IDE, this is really red. It's really annoying because this is not really following our standard or the open source standard we have for this code. It will be very annoying for her, it will be annoying for me, because as a reviewer, I want a robot that automatically is going to give this feedback. So this is where the CI comes in. I think it's a very important concept, and then the humans should focus on the real review. Like, okay, well, maybe this algorithm could be improved somehow. And this is where the trust comes in, because if you don't build this trust, you are going to be afraid that whenever you review somebody else's code, um, is basically she or he is going to uh, be a bit defensive or uh, there is going to be conflict. When you have this trust, you don't fear the conflict. So this is basically the discipline we want to set 
And discipline is enabling flexibility, not the other way around. That's another idea we have in our list. So then, the important metric here, 43, if I want to know if a team is mature in DevOps, I will ask if I can remove 10 lines of code and deploy to production. So if that team is basically having good procedures, you will never be able to push that code to production. The build should be read. And maybe if it goes through, then uh, maybe what those lines should have been removed. Or if it goes through, everything is green and something fails, and this is the very, very, very important topic, that's good. Because there was something wrong with my code, and I want to know what's wrong, so we can continuously improve it. So we are not scared about breaking it, because we will uh, roll back it very, very easily. So talking about confidence and discipline, we talk about immutable infrastructures, infrastructure as code. And then if you try to transform an organization like Allianz, there is actually those workflow approval processes that, you know, the developers, the modern developers, they don't really appreciate. But here is the idea that we actually turn this around. Because they might, they, you know, every developer once in a while is tempted to log into this production server to just to do a quick fix. Even though they use the Docker files, they have the CI, CDs, but I've seen that in the team. It is happening. So why don't we use those, the friction in the end, to make it hard for them to log in and use SSH, right? Implement an approval workflow for SSH access, make it hard to use, and track the frequency of use. So if we move a, a step ahead, and this is one we did not share in the slides, but have in our list, how about setting incentives to cut this number into halves? Every quarter, every half a year, you name it. I mean, this, this is maybe not the best practice, but you know, just some ideas for you to discuss with your teams, with your management to, to get the DevOps transformation starting. And the other one is like manage a top 10 list of the long running systems, put it on a big screen, call it the wall of shame. I mean, in these traditional IT shops, there's a lot of appreciation of uptime. If the server runs for two years, I mean, this is, you know, the, the record-breaking machine or whatever your experience is. Maybe there are servers that run for eight years. But in the end, the longer the server runs, the higher the risk. That if ever you need to reboot the machine, it's not going to be working. And that's where usually the heroes come into place, right? Those big IT organizations, they're really good in firefighting and getting the production systems back online if stuff breaks. And that's when the heroes are made. Sorry to say, but DevOps is not the place for heroes to be. That should be the default message. And that ties into the change versus the run discussion that in the big organizations you're having, right? So change, the development team, they want to maximize the change, they want to put code as often as they can into production to meet the project deadline that might get tighter and tighter but then basically move on to the, pro the next project. So there's not a concept of, of ownership. On the other hand, you have the run, the operations. They, of course, want to minimize, minimize the change because change could introduce troubles. They want to assure reliable operations because they get called if something goes wrong, right? They carry a pager and you want to minimize how often you get called in the end. So, this is, I guess, why we are here, because we want to make the two work, to work to, um, together more easily or with less friction. So we thought about in the ideas, maybe we have some alternative success criteria to measure if this collaboration between the two actually works. And in our team, everybody is carrying a pager every once in a while. We do so because I strongly believe the feedback from operating a system is very valuable. Just an example from this week, Sunday night, after an upgrade, we had a false alarm in the alerting system. So the poor little guy who got called 1 a.m. in the morning from the incident coordination that we have in place, Monday morning, 8.30, he reached out to the guys who operate the monitoring system, and said, guys, you gotta fix this, I don't wanna call, be called ever this week again for this you know, false alarm. Because it should be cheap money in the end, right? If you do it right, and it's not too risky, then the burden to do the on-call and 
if you're lucky, you get a premium for your salary to do the on-call, it should be cheap money. Then, if you make the on-call rotation a voluntary, let's say, self-service kind of self-organizing mechanism, and you don't have a hard time to find the guys who volunteer to run the platform, it's running pretty stable, right? So it should be a reliable system. That was an observation we made because it is self-service in our team to take over the on-call shift. And it's not only, you know, super motivated young guys that want to, you know, that would work for Google or, you know, just identify with it. There's also more traditional people in there, but they, they are not worrying about taking the on-call over. And then, of course, and that's borrowed from the site reliability, right, site reliability engineering book, stop the feature development if your engineers do not create co code for more than 50% of the time. Then also, obviously, something is wrong. And the message here is not so much about the statement, but about getting it into work, making sure that you are, have the procedures in place to actually stop the development. If you manage to do so, then I think the DevOps maturity, whatever you want to call this, is high. I mean, this is maybe the easier observation. Try to make that happen in your organization. So, DevOps equals the new ops, no ops, chat ops, git ops, whatever you name it, right? Um, it's not less appreciation over operations, it's rather the opposite, but we do it differently. We basically make everything a software engineering problem. Yes, please. Right, so we maintain our systems following infrastructure as code approaches. Everything is defined by code. We have immutable, in, immutable infrastructures. Runtime should be elastic. Um, they are constantly changing, constantly ch shaped. Um, and yes, they need to be available 24 seven. So once we make everything a software engineering problem, all oh right, sorry. Did you skip two slides, no? One of the other ideas that, that we have is, at least from my personal experience, um, there is still a lot of emails sending around in traditional IT operations to actually operate the systems, to order servers, to plan migrations, to do whatever. So we believe, or we, we think we challenge the organizations, like if for the operations, at least for the operations, you get rid of the email server because emailing is not digital, digital, right? Emails are not a warm handshake, which is what you want to have in operations. That's why you have discussions about chat ops or, or git ops in the end. They are not a processing tool. They shouldn't be used to order servers to initiate approval processes. And they are also not a billboard. I mean, I guess everybody knows the Jenkins that spams the inbox due to failing, box, uh, failing builds. What is the appreciation of a developer, you know, having a spammed inbox? Um, and it, it, it can be anything. It can be a Jenkins, it can be a Cloud Foundry operating, like the Bosch spamming you. It's, it's by email that shouldn't work. So instead use, right, actually you can use phone calls or video conferences to do the warm handshake, chat. I mean, chat ops, it's obviously in, in their Slack, whatever you want to use. Direct contact, also pretty much appreciated. I mean, in the end, we talk about co-location of people very often. Then instead of process tools, let's go for APIs. If we, value, if we value developers, let's give them APIs to also complete their day-to-day -day tasks. If they need to book the time, why don't you open up the API of the time booking system? Why do you need to go to maybe a sluggy API and a web UI, sorry, and then enter your numbers manually? Because who knows what comes out of this? Maybe an aggregation of the API, maybe you have some you know, innovation internally and the process tooling will get better and better. And then yes, use internet blocks, dashboards, and alertings that could of course reach out to the direct contact, being Slack alerts or whatever you have. We actually had one incident just 
to share an impression where the email system was also affected during the outage. And we were pretty happy that we had our you know, Slack channel open so we could coordinate the teams in, in India and Bangkok to get the systems up and running or at least check the health of our systems. So what we need to overcome in this DevOps transformation is the risk aversion versus the change aversion. Minimizing risk, of course, is a good thing. And in an insurance business, that's not difficult to get a buy-in, right? Because in the end, we're managing risks. Um, but there's a couple of assumptions that don't hold in the DevOps world. So the, the dangerous assumption is change equals risk. And we could continue, well, change should be opportunity to create more value. But the fatal assumption is no change equals no risk. And I think we illustrated earlier already with this top 10 list of the long running servers, how you have one approach to um, assess the risk in the end. So here we had the, the idea, please. So you did not have a single outage in the last month, restart production now. Why would you do so? In the end, you, you define service level objectives, or if you agree with the customer, you have the service level agreements. Why don't you use what you promised for an innovation budget or for a testing budget, even in production? Because what is the value of over accomplishing the service level agreement? Rather use it to identify unknown dependencies. We are operating a central source code management repository. And we did not plan to do zero downtime maintenance of the source code repository. So we usually announce the downtime because what is the impact if a customer cannot develop for 10 or 15 minutes? I mean, if it's Git, they can still push and commit locally. They don't need to have the remote server. So what is the real business impact? That is what we did to challenge the organization. So during an, one of those maintenance windows, we actually identified that our customers use our Git server to store their configuration files, their Spring Cloud configuration files. So here we are having a runtime dependency on a system that is not highly available and was not planned to be highly available. And that's exactly the, the idea of the statement behind this. So if you have this budget to spend, use it. And then in, in the end, we, we, we get to the, how do we manage our ongoing work in, in, in the company? And the big companies, they're used to work in projects. We have migration projects. We have a new, let's say, DevOps project, maybe even. But that's what they are good at, right? So there's a budget defined, there's a time estimated, success is basically measured whether you are on time, on budget, um, and you don't really get a feedback once it's released. Most likely, the project organization will be dissolved afterwards, and there is no ongoing support for it. So it's really process-centric. There's a change, a launch, and maybe a couple of more launches. Where we want to get to is the right-hand side. We want to encourage people to take over responsibility, and that's basically when you manage a product or a service. Because then the success is basically defined on the uptake by the customer, and that's the money we earned with it in the end. So we follow a customer-centric approach. And that we should even do internally. So in, in, in my setting, we have infrastructure still operated in, in the traditional classic, let's say, ITIL way, um, with slow feedback cycles, with maybe not much APIs available. Um, but we still need to file tickets. And this 26, we have a 27, a 28, and a 29, which say the amount of tickets, the amount of phone calls, the amount of people that you need to talk to to run your service is actually an indicator of how well your DevOps organization or how mature a DevOps organization is. Maybe, right? These are only proposals that we are really happy to discuss with you. But I guess most of you have experienced a similar situation. It's like, okay, we, I need to have this new server now or this new Apache in the DM set. 
H how do I change the configuration and the thing that I'm not controlling? You've got to talk to people, figure out who is operating, who knows who to contact, and who to send an email template to. That's exactly not the self-service API DevOps way of doing it. That's why we, have, we posted the idea of collecting on the number of tickets and then saying, well, if there's a high amount, you don't have a good DevOps maturity. Okay. Is any motorbike rider here? Why? Oh, oh, that's cool. More than I thought. <laughs> 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 so, well, uh, actually, ch change is counterintuitive. And I think there is a very, very good example uh, regarding motorbike driving. And after 90 years since the first motorbike, there were some drivers that realized, hey, when I push to the right, it's basically with the handle, but I'm going to the left, if I have enough speed, the motorbike is steering to the right. So then when you say, hey, I go left, and the motorbike goes right, this is actually counterintuitive. And they realized that this method is very good for steering a motorbike when you go very, very fast. And you do it like with small changes. But it's very, very difficult to understand. So the discipline here was, OK, when you are teaching a um, motorbike rider, you tell him, hey, push right. You don't say turn left. Push right, and the motorbike will go right. So this is interesting because we continuously say, hey, change often, small changes to production all the time. But this is counterintuitive because, because with every change in production, there is risk. You will have more mistakes. When you change something, usually it breaks. Even if you have the best discipline in the world, sometimes it will break. So yeah, this is actually the example. It has an explanation if you are interested with the gyroscopic effect. And um, the lesson here is that if we really want to go fast, we have to use, to use more difficult techniques in order to do so. OK, so who likes the motorbike from the left? <laughs> so everybody else likes the motorbike from the right, I guess. <laughs> so well, this is actually the explanation out of it. This change requires engineering. So not all the motorbikes are going to be able to steer in that way. Uh, because basically we put the center of mass uh, and the contact patch really far away from each other. That means that it's going to be more difficult to steer when you go really, really fast. So the motorbike from the left is able to go 260 kilometers per hour, and you can really turn right and turn left just doing this. A small movement is going to turn your motorbike when you go crazy fast. The right motorbike is actually quite cool. It's the motorbike you want to store in your garage. I mean, you go there and everyone is going to look at you. You are even going to, to be a senior with this motorbike. With the left one, maybe you're going to be a crazy, <laughs> a crazy driver. And the thing is that with this engineering, we can't really go fast. So it's cool, but really you don't want to do that. You want to win the race. You want to be competitive. So at the end, you have to engineer based on your use case. So the requirements of your business is, hey, we want to change fast. Hey, we want to really bring value to the customer uh, really often. You have to take uh, really difficult software engineering decisions. And not only about software engineering, also about team organization. So like a super bike, super sport motorbike, we had to engineer our system. And nobody said that it was going to be easy. It's actually very, very difficult. Because first of all, you have this cultural shift. So how do you teach people that they had to change very, very often to production? It's crazy, especially in an old organization. I remember uh, some time ago with a um, very, very experienced uh, test and integration engineer. He wanted to test everything. Like, yeah, yeah, well, we will test everything. There are going to be no problems when you have this deployment in production assured. Like, I don't believe that. I mean, there are always problems, especially when you have a big integration and a big change coming in. And I told him, like, well, 
just bring a small change. I don't care. I mean, of course, you have to use unit test. I think it really brings uh, instant feedback, and it's like very, very. It's actually the most important testing for me. Um, and if it breaks, it's okay. I mean, we should put an effort in having a very, very good monitoring system that is going to tell us, hey, look, you had this problem, fix it right away. Because if there is an outage and I haven't been automatically notified, I think it should be top priority to improve that system. So it's going to tell us that something was wrong. And as the changes are small, so you are still really, really, really slowly, if you have a problem in production, if I'm still in my motorbike, and it's like a small mistake, I can correct it really, really fast. So that's actually the, the philosophy out of it. Like a super sport motorbike, we really want to have a system that is going to uh, reduce our MTTR. And another last note about this slide uh, regarding the MTBF. So if we are deploying once to production per year, of course, we are going to have a bigger MTBF. So we have to be careful with this metric because sometimes it's okay, we are failing fast, that MTBF is smaller, but at the end, what we have to take into account is the yearly SLA. So maybe we deploy 10 times per day. Usually, it should, I mean, it should go fine. The deployment shouldn't break all the time. Then there is something wrong with the system. But overall, if we take all the downtime into account per year, the SLA should be much better that you have a big integration change coming into production that is going to break the system for one day. So we are talking maybe about an SLA that is five hours per year that can be achievable depending on the system. And well, <laughs> we talk a lot about how are we going to engineer the systems, but what about the team? So. In an Amazon offsite, the managers, and I guess you are very familiar to this uh, statement, they said, hey, our employees should communicate more often. And then Jeff said, no, should be like that. I mean, communication is terrible. You say communication is terrible, and I'm like, whoa, what the hell? So actually, he's right. If you, if you go to a party, and there are a lot of people, like more than six, I mean, 10 people around that, uh, you can talk to everybody. So there are going to be like subgroups. So communication is very difficult when the team size increases. So why don't we keep the team sizes like maximum to six person and keep communication simple because then we will have less links. So in a team of six, we have basically 15 links. When you grow and double the team is 66. But in a small organization, and I'm not talking about a big one, with 50, is completely unmanageable. So the idea here is to have a cross-functional team. Six people, you have the product owner, then you can have five developers. Maybe you have a technical lead, maybe you don't. You keep them cross-functional, maybe there is a developer who knows more about the backend. Maybe there is a developer who knows more about front-end stuff, about databases. So then they are benefiting from their experience. So we can call them full stack if you want. And you keep the teams independent. So they should have complete freedom. They shouldn't be hindered by the company processes. They should uh, really be able to work with other teams using APIs. This is basically a very, very important point. Because now, I mean, you hear a lot about scaling Agile and the Spotify tribe model and whatever big company, big enterprise process, uh, well, these certifications for scaling, all of this. There is no name for this. I think it's common sense when you work in a startup and you basically try to bring this open source model to how the startups works with other, work with others. And that's it. You have independent teams, small teams. So what are they doing? Maybe you have a desktop application, and now we have enough technology that is going to enable um, different roles, like I'm going to take care of this part of the desktop application, of this view. And I'm going to deploy that. I'm going to have end-to-end. -end, and if other teams want to use it, I can expose interfaces that are well documented or APIs, because maybe my application is a backend application that all the different applications are going to use 
uh, with a very well-defined and documented API. Then you are cutting the dependency. You don't have to ask people directly, hey, give me this. No, they go to your documentation, they follow the software discipline, and they develop that on their own. You are kind of a software provider in your own company. With the internal tools, it's the same. There might be some teams that are not developing tools for the customer. Maybe they develop tools for other teams. And they follow exactly the same. Documentation or API, everything defined with code. And now the managers are coming in. So <laughs> somebody has to manage the teams, isn't it? And well, we, of course, have a lack of people with technical expertise and also with good communication skills. This is really a big problem in our society. So what you have at the end, a bunch of non-technical managers coming in and making bad decisions. I don't blame them. They are smart, but they have no technical background. They don't know the trade-offs. They never developed anything. They don't know how difficult it is. So at the end, what you have is the death march. OK, guys, we had this date. Whatever, we had to achieve it. Listening to any reasonable opinions. And then we had to do that. We have extra work. And we have and the developers are doing the trade-offs. They don't have any other option than sacrificing quality, usually. That's the common problem. In order to reach the functionality that is asked by this manager. So that's why you really need technical managers. At least, I mean, maybe they are not uh, developing uh, continuously in the project. But they should at least be able to deploy one line of code to production. If they know how to do that, yeah, you do that. <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, if you have the discipline, if they know how that worked, one single line of code is not a big deal. Can be like, change this button in the web application. They should be able to do that. I'm talking about middle management, not the CEO. They are managing software teams. They should know how to do that, because then, they know how to make good decisions based on their trade-offs. And now we come to how do we take decisions? And there's actually studies that say, well, first we have an intuition, and then we find the rationale of why we decided the way we do. So we need to grow an intuition that also covers technology. So how do we spread and scale the DevOps around, right? So how do we make the head of DevOps, or how do we give him an intuition for his decisions? And just a side note, well, if you're having a DevOps team, are you doing it wrong already? But that's maybe not the discussion we want to have in this talk now. So how do you scale out from, let's say, you created a nucleus of a team um, of DevOps into the organization? So you could apply a missionary model, right? So you create a brave new world, a pink cloud of happiness, where people work in a DevOps way, and then you send individual team members out to the wild and hope they will survive. But they might be either you know, the fancy clown that talks about the new thing that the other team members in the new team where you send him to do not value yet, so he will have a hard time and maybe come back or just you know, quit and go somewhere else. So missionary might not work. If you have other examples, please let me know afterwards. So option number two, you take people from the old team, send them into a boot camp, or call it incubation if you want. We actually did that also. We have set up an incubation program to, to you know, train people on the DevOps values, let's say, and give them a, a peek into the DevOps way of working, and then you send them back again. Also difficult because one day, once they are back, of course they know their old fellow team members, but yeah, maybe you can't change them either. And then Shanghai, you drag everybody into the new world. Hopefully voluntarily, but Shanghai has some tradition, so it was not always. Uh, voluntarily, but basically enlarge the pink cloud of happiness, make the whole organization work that way. And no, I can't tell you which of them really succeeds. We are still in the process. It's still, the journey is still ongoing. 
So I guess there's other talks that give you frameworks to do so um, that consultancies are going to you know, sell to you, I believe. In the end, what I think or what we think is really important, coming back to the friction, is that you manage to create an enablement culture. An enablement cu culture that gives power to the developers, because again, we value developer velocity in the end. And you can do so if you re 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 sorry, reduce the friction, right? Because then you have low invests, there's less at stake, fewer moving parts, less efforts, less money spent, that you can support and then basically the cycle goes on. As opposed to the left hand side, the high friction where you have higher invests in bigger kind of releases. So every release is more risky, more is at stake, um, which is why you will even, uh, invent more controls in the end, right? And there is less trust, obviously. So we thought about if we had the the freedom or the chance to de define how the budget is spent inside the organization. Maybe we can make use of these two, the disablement cycle and the enablement cycle, by having an exponential complexity to obtain budget when the budget request gets higher. But getting lower amount of, monies, of money is actually pretty easy. That should sound natural, but most of you, I believe, have the experience if you already have like a 50 million project running, adding another half a million is easy, right? Because it's already a big project. So we want to turn this around and basically make it really easy, low invest, trust the people that the money they ask for, the new tools they want to test um, will be used for a good sake in the end. Or how about we do in, in reverse mentoring? Why not having our, our managers or even the senior management working together with these millennials or whatever the, the new generation will be to teach them how to use the new technology? I mean, how many people, I know there's, car, there, there's a car industry talk uh, later today, how many of the top management do you believe are using car sharing? Like a car to go or a drive now? On a, on a regular basis. But I think it, it changed my way of living. I mean, when we came over here, I just you know, invited Dario to take a car to go to come to the conference. And it, 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 it needs to go into, into your own daily, let's say, habit, I believe. That's what we want to say. Now we're going to come to a set of the topics that also influence the success of your DevOps transformation but are far, far and farther away from technology in the end. Um, I think the picture is still from your startup days, right? So it's a real picture of Dario when he joined the startup earlier to joining Allianz. Um, this was his first day at, at work, basically. Right? They gave him an equipment that he asked for in the beginning. Um, we didn't put the picture of of other start days into the presentation. But the meaning, what we want to say is, instead of wasting time to re, to, and resources to fight the inevitable, empower the developers and reap the rewards, right? Why don't you give every developer 3,000 euros in the beginning when he joins to select the machine that he wants? It doesn't need to be a MacBook. Just, you know, give him whatever he wants because he knows what's best. Don't standardize the size of the screen. If the developer wants to have a bigger screen on the, on the laptop, let's go for it. Trust him that he will pick what he needs for and then give him a recurring budget to you know, upgrade the machines, basically. So what is it that people are looking for and how do we need to change the way HR supports people with a DevOps culture in the end? We need to offer a technical career path. In big companies, normally, you manage people, you get higher salaries. That's what we think we need to change. Stay at the edge of the technology, provide tools, tools to experiment, handle blockers and dependencies. This is usually a, a challenge for bigger organizations to retain the talent. If you manage to attract talent, retain them, shield them from the old risk protection mechanisms in the end and processes. Avoid the micromanagement, again, trust your people and find ways to keep the salary competitive. Right? Bigger organizations, the longer you stay in the company, the higher your salary grows. It's less performance-based or 
let's say, market relevance based. And I think here's, here's also a, a big chunk of work to be done in making a DevOps transformation a great success. Okay, so we are making a lot of friends. We are going to talk about outsourcing and how we actually expect it to be. So if you give a man a fish and he will eat for one day, but what did you teach him how to fish? And this is the usual statement. And what we think it happens sometimes is Okay, if you teach a man how to fish, you're wasting a wonderful business opportunity. So this is how sometimes the outsourcing works. And uh, basically, how are, are we going to change this, uh, this culture? We can demand something from our business partners. So if we are in a, in a big company, of course we are going to outsource stuff. So we are talking a lot about open source. We also, as a big company, should or want to contribute to the open source. We have these over-defined principles, so why? I think that the first uh, requirement here is that the business partner should have this open source mind as well. So then all these communication problems are going to be solved, which is the biggest broker. And if, um, if a partner uses the word handover, there is something wrong. I don't want to work with a company that is going to say, hey, we are going to hand over this stuff because well, it's software, is developer, de software is developed and now you have to handle it. It's your problem now. No, I mean, software is never the problem from, from somebody else. And another idea, and actually Amazon does it with the professional services, not only Amazon. Well, if you need to have help, we can give you a consultant that is going to work as an intern with your team for as much time as you need. I think that model is very, very interesting when you are outsourcing stuff. And of course, having a flexible pricing plan. For instance, the best example is a cloud platform. So another topic <laughs> is the bullshit mode. This is what we call, uh, actually what we're doing now, but I, <laughs> want to, I want to think that it's in the good way. Because we are talking a lot and yeah, making gestures and uh, look guys, so beautiful, the motorbikes, all of that. So I think this is very important for people with technical background. They should learn how to enable bullshit mode. Because there is a lot of people out there without technical expertise that can do that pretty well. And maybe some of them are going to be your colleagues. So what did you learn from them? Actually, you can learn from a lot of consultants as well that are very experts at doing this. These seduction techniques, all of that. Why don't technical people learn how to do that? Because they actually, uh, the society needs this. Because now, the important thing about the bullshit mode, if you want to do it the right way, is that you have to show something. So just use data, show management, hey, look, well, nice buzzwords, uh, blockchain, uh, pff, machine learning with blockchain, and <laughs> show them, okay, this is what we have. We have 5,000 active users. We have this problem. I mean, sometimes showing problems is fine because you are giving transparency, you are building trust also with management. And especially when you talk with, uh, with top management, they like data, they are smart people, they have no clue about technology, no clue about what the hell you are doing. They know the buzzwords, and it's also sometimes good to use the buzzwords. And well, of course, if you have a demo of your application, that would be great to have something to show. This is very, very important. Always show something. So what about security in the DevOps world? Yeah, we, are not, uh, we are not allowed to talk about security, sorry. <laughs> 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 so we're here to learn about how to, you know, do the DevOps sec or DevSecOps, whatever you want to call it. So with, with that, let's get, let's keep the journey going. If you want to reach out to us, we are here for the next two days. This is how you find us on Twitter. Um, thanks a lot for your attendance, for the big attendance, and we have a couple of questions that actually worked, so we can okay. go yeah, we have through them. Time. We will pull them out. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, thanks.